I bring you greetings from the Law Society of Kenya, currently under the leadership of uh, the legal political party called the Brave New Bar. <laughs> I also bring you greetings from uh, Amani National Congress, which uh, I'm proudly associated to be a member. We stand for Uchumi Bora, Msingi the Beti, Omaendeleo, the democracy. May I also welcome you to Westlands constituency. <laughs> Permit me to start by thanking the organizers of this uh, conference. It comes at the most appropriate time, a tipping point in the democratic and constitutional history of the Republic of Kenya. The speakers before me have manifested a lot of tranquility and peace. Permit me to deploy some intellectual violence in this discussion. You see, history at times gives you the best. And often it just gives you what is available. No wonder, therefore, the discussion of electoral justice in Kenya should not be isolated to the constitution, the structures, the legislative framework, and the institutions that oversight this process. I premise my discourse on one fundamental issue. The people themselves, the people you want in office, either elected or appointed. And this is fundamental because you can purpose to have a free and fair election. But who are you going to elect? Let me start from what uh, a constitutional scholar by the name Professor Ben Nubweze says. He says this, the president coordinates and therefore dominates both the executive and legislative processes of government. And he poses this, Unless parliament is in fact independent of the executive, then the sovereignty of parliament, to which African leaders are fond of constantly referring, means simply the sovereignty of the executive. Do you relate with this insofar as Kenya is concerned? Does parliament give you the results you want? Of the three arms of government, you should not find surprise in the statement that the judiciary appears to be the one that is most prepared for this election. And indeed, they are. Parliament and executive are not. If I had two hours, we would have had a very long discourse on this issue. But why is it that parliament is least prepared? The other day, a very good friend of mine, a retired judge of the Court of Appeal, asked me, Lord Nelson, why do you want to go to Parliament? <laughs> I, I, I told him, uh, King Richard, I've uh, accomplished my three-point agenda as president of the Law Society. I need to go and fix Parliament. Then he told me, no, you can't go to Parliament because it is a house of unlearned fellows. <laughs> I told him, no, King Richard, we have so many of our colleagues there. Then he told me, they're not learned, perhaps they're just educated. Now, let me depart from what Professor Nobweza says about the responsibilities of elected leaders insofar as the Constitution is concerned. He says this, no constitution, however strongly entrenched, can be guaranteed against the temptations of power on the part of the executive unless there is an independent legislature to act as a counterpoise against such a temptations. And unless there is a strong national ethic, strong national ethic against executive pretensions. The other day we were told 
you do not require a degree to be a member of the National Assembly or of the County Assembly. I do not want to espouse a view on that point. But let me just read what Nogueza said as he concludes. It is members, by virtue of their education and standing in society, who are eminently and well placed to act as the articulators and guardians of the nation's ethic. And the assembly provides them with an excellent platform from which to try to mobilize public opinion against abuse of power by the executive. A transformative constitution, the best in the world, has been in place for the last 10 years. Have the people you've elected to parliament been able to oversight the executive? Have they been able to rein on taxation, excessive borrowing? Have they been able to ensure that there's equity and parity insofar as two-third gender representative is concerned? Have they oversighted the executive when it comes to public appointments and declarations? These are the main points that you must consider even as you ponder on how best to guarantee electoral justice in Kenya. Permit me to say this. It is a game of musical chairs. The problem is not with the people. The problem is with the people who you've put to sit on those chairs. Often the people you've put in these chairs will cobble arrangements befitting their peculiar, their peculiar situations, power sharing. You see, on the 28th of February 2008, a coalition agreement was cobbled, the result of which was to create a hybrid presidential and parliamentary system in Kenya. How far did we go with it? Did you see the bickering between the Prime Minister and my very good friend, the former Vice President? We're being told this is an enterprise that will guarantee electoral justice and fairness. And uh, Senior Counsel, just allow me to fire at close range because uh, it is at this point that we need to deploy intellectual violence. <laughs> 10 years later, we're being told we need to do exactly that which we did on the 28th of February. Is that the solution? Will you find reprieve in these measures you're putting in place to guarantee electoral justice? Perhaps that is a question that you need to consider. Justice Hugh and Krigler, the judge given the responsibility of uh, giving us a solution to the problem that bedeviled us after the contested 2007 general election, said this in his executive summary. Kenya's constitutional and legal framework relating to election contains a number of weaknesses and inconsistencies that weaken its effectiveness. This legislation needs urgent and radical revision, including consolidation. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, Kenyan, all that Krigler said we do has been done. We have consolidated all electoral laws. We have reformed. The institutions are in place. They are capable of delivering. What then is the problem? The problem is not the chairs. The problem is the chair ladies and the chairman. And often, you will find them seated on on seats like this, beside a table like this. On rare occasions, it's you Kenyans who provide the foothold for these tables. What is the solution? You must say no. Stand up, there will be no table for them to sit. You see, let's compare the democratic process in Commonwealth Africa since the fall of Berlin and the communist, the communist state. 
Why is it that in Ghana there has been profound stability whenever we go for elections? How is it that we don't experience the problems in Kenya? In Zambia, there was a complete metamorphosis of what the people of Ghana and Zambia intended. You see, in Ghana, it was a little bit drastic. It was violent. But there is stability. Uh, unfortunately, many of us here may not even remember the name of the president of Ghana right now. Do you? Yes, it's a good point. Do you know the name of the president of Zambia? Good. Sacrifices had to be made. Chiloba, the one who took over from uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, had to be jailed for the message to be passed. Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings had to take drastic measures in Ghana to guarantee democratic sustainability. People cannot be allowed to be corrupt insofar as regime changes are concerned. It's as simple as that. You may undertake all these discourses. They will take us nowhere. Let me progress. Sorry if I look at, like a professor of law with papers tune all over. Maybe one day I'll be a professor of law. Fast forward, 9th March 2018, the great grand handshake. What did they say? This is what they said as they stood on the staircase of that building to guarantee you that they want to bring change. There are changes that are required in our system of governance for us to succeed, and we have been in a process of reform to deal with them for the last 20 years. Really? Yet, despite all the reforms, we continue to have deep and bitter disagreements, ethnic antagonism, and divisive political competition have become a way of life. I'm sure they do not have in their library the Krigler report. This is how they conclude. His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta and His Excellency Raela Odinga have agreed to roll out a program that will implement their shared objectives shared objectives. How many of them? Two individuals. The program shall establish an office and retain a retinue of advisors to assist in this implementation. They have mandated both Ambassador Martin Kimani and Mr. Paul Mwangi to observe, to oversee the establishment. Now, this is where I give accolades to my mother's agement and my very good friend, Martha Karua Senior Council. She said no. She was alone. Many here sought to pursue a Sir Neville Chamberlain approach to pacify the aggressor. To what end? <laughs> well, I don't want to unpack this because a demand letter may be drafted and forwarded to my office as I speak. Where's Benta Opante? Benta, these, these are the real issues. Executive overreach, inability of parliament to reign supreme. I don't know how much time I have, but uh, the, the two minutes will do, the two minutes will do. Let me, let me tell you what uh, your Solicitor General said insofar as uh, the need for this constitution. Yeah, yeah, please maintain some silence. It is very rare that uh, you listen to the President of the Law Society. <laughs> Thank you. He said this, that the BBI process is supposed to preempt perennial election-related violence 
end marginalization, and it is imperative for the process to be concluded before the next general election scheduled for next year. That is what I decide. Now, friends, you see, you may be looking for these solutions everywhere, but the solutions may not be there. They are here in your midst. And this is what Krigler said in conclusion. In order to start trying to prevent a recurrence of the tragic aftermath of the 2007 general elections, Kenyans from president to peasant will have to do an agonizing stock take of where their country stands from president to peasant, bourgeoisie to peasant. They will have to show their commitment to the rule of law and its equal applicability to all citizens irrespective of economic, social, and political or any other belief. And it makes the conclusion quite affirmative. No, the solution does not merely lie in constitutional and legislative changes. The culture of impunity in Kenya needs a fix too. The relevant law enforcement institutions also need to do their jobs properly. I think I'm not competent to add to what that great jurist said. But because I'm an artist, permit me to show you two cartoons that exemplify what is happening. This is the standard of June 2001, must have been on the 14th, it's by Gado. You've seen it? Okay. Fine. Let me, let me just read uh, in brief what, uh, what it says. Now, Wanjiku, I think, I don't know who is, Wanjiku is speaking to. She says, we don't seem to know what the problem is with our elections. We keep going in circles. Then uh, she pauses and proceeds. Manual versus electronic system. We procure new systems and register new voters every time. Then Wanjiku proceeds. And remember, the other gentleman on the other side, who often feels he is Wanjiku, whenever it is convenient, is just looking. And then uh, she says, we create new laws while keeping old and troublesome ones to benefit the few. And you know, after a long pause, the gentleman who always feels he is Wanjiku says, indeed, IBC is ready to conduct a referendum. Lastly, there is a cartoon in the Daily Nation of the 22nd of June, 2021, at page 18. It is very historic, bloodlines. We do not have a parliament because it has been emasculated. We do not have an opposition because it has been purchased. That is the state of affairs in Kenya. Kenyans, on the part of the law society, this is my commitment. I've asked my members, especially the youthful ones, to call off the game they will stand up and there will be no table for these individuals to sit on and determine the fate of Kenyans. A majority of my youthful advocates will run for elective office. They will go to parliament. They will be in the National Assembly. They will be in the Senate. And I want to beseech you all Kenyans, irrespective of your professional qualification, to take the opportunity Otherwise, the game of musical chairs will never end. We'll have these discussions today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and maybe we'll be back here 10 years and review what Krigler has said. I don't want to be doing that. Thank you.